Welcome to the YouTube edition of the StoryWise podcast. This segment is just part of a full one-hour interview, which you can hear on iTunes and at GenGrisantiConsultancy.com. Welcome to StoryWise, the podcast designed to give you the in-depth story behind some of our top storytellers as a way to inform, inspire, and motivate you to believe that you too can make your dreams a reality. My name is Jen Grisanti. I am a story career consultant at Jen Grisanti Consultancy, Inc., a writer's consultancy designed to help you accomplish your writing goals and reach your career destination through one-on-one consults, seminars, and teleseminars. And I am beyond thrilled and excited to have with me as my guest today, Janet Tamaro. Janet is the creator, showrunner, and executive producer of the hit television series Rizzoli and Isles on TNT on Monday nights. And last night was a phenomenal season finale, so it will be back in June. You can also catch it on direct television. And let me tell you a little bit about Janet. Janet was a television correspondent for many places, ABC News. And she also is a best-selling author of such books as So That's What They're For, before becoming a screenwriter in 2000. Her first script was episode 13 on the first season of Law & Order SBU. Janet was nominated for an Emmy for Sleeper Cell, shares a Writers Guild Award for Outstanding Series for Lost, and wrote two seasons on the hit series Bones. She also produced and wrote for The Black Sash, The Court, Line of Fire, and was a consulting producer on Tell Me You Love Me. Previously, Tamaro covered national news for ABC News One, among other news outlets, and was based in New York and Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles. She reported and produced investigative stories for long-form news magazine shows, including Inside Edition and America's Most Wanted. She won several journalism awards for her work. Tamaro has a bachelor's degree from Berkeley and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. She is married to moto journalist and Cycle World radio host Steve Natt. They have two daughters. Welcome, Janet. Wow. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> so I have to start with Rizzoli and Isles. I because, padded my resume, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I love your resume. Oh, well, thanks. what I love about your resume especially, and I think it's good for all writers to know, is the fact that you had a large career in journalism and you transformed that into a career in television and screenwriting and book writing. And I think that's great for everyone to hear. Um, I, I think it's all part of the same thing. I yeah. think if you're a storyteller, there are so many different ways to be a storyteller. Yes. I, I am in total agreement. And and on that note, I would love, then we'll jump into Rizzoli and Isles. Tell me, like, when you think about, uh, and it probably does apply to Rizzoli and Isles as well, when you think about everything that you learned about storytelling and the organization of a story from investigative reporting and being a correspondent, how has it applied to your TV writing? It was phenomenal training. I mean, you don't become a journalist in order to someday write one-hour drama. It was not something that I wanted to do. It was not something that I looked to do. And by that, I mean I never, I never expected to be working in Hollywood writing a show. My goal had always been to be a journalist. And so everything I did, I did to to better my skills as as a journalist, as a working journalist. But so much of it is transferable. And I, I think for me at least, because I did both print and television, what probably came in most handy was how quickly I can write um, and how much pressure I had learned to work under because – Let's face it in news if you <laughs> if you miss a deadline it's black air so uh it's 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 pretty noticeable if you don't get your work done uh, and I think the other thing about it was always condensing and screenplay is 
in some ways, I think writing a novel, the screenwriters talk about wanting to write a novel because you yearn for more space on the page. There's only so much in a screenplay. And so every everything you write has to matter. Everything that you, you know, every line of action, every bit of dialogue, it has to have a reason. In fact, it has to have multiple reasons for being on the page. And working as a television correspondent, again, you have very little page space. Uh, I did anywhere from a 30-second story to a 13-minute piece. But you're always fighting that clock. And, and it's all about condensing and being able to tell the best story you can tell really in the shortest amount of time. Which is excellent. Uh, actually outstanding training for editing your own work. Absolutely. Oh, that's Absolutely. fantastic. I love that. Yeah. Okay, so jumping into Rizzoli and Isles. I mean, that pilot and that finale were unbelievable. Like, truly, I think the, the pilot blew my mind in that, for me, the pilot felt like a finale. Like, it felt like something that a Dexter would work a whole season towards, and you started with it. And that I loved because it immediately drew me into the characters and the situations from episode number one. Um, how, because I know you adapted this from a series of books. What was the author's name? The what author is? is Tess Gerritsen. She's written seven books, Resilient. Actually, she's written more than seven, but seven with these two characters. And what was that like? Like how much when in writing the pilot? Did you have to stay close to book number one? Did you? No, I had a whole lot of freedom. I mean, I, they. she gave me certainly more freedom than I gave myself. One of the... the one of the problems for me about adapting work is I, I feel a certain, um, I don't want to say reverence, but it's somebody else's work that, that you're, you're taking. And, and really, in order to make it interesting, you have to make it your own. So when I first read The, the Surgeon and the Apprentice, which is what the pilot is based on, it's very um, dense, very dark. Um, she's a doctor, so there's a lot of medical terminology. There are a lot of red herrings. There's a, there. It, it's a, she writes these page-turning mysteries that work very well in a novel that don't don't always translate onto the screen. And and so what I ended up doing is reading all seven of her novels and trying to figure out a starting point for my myself, and then deciding at a certain point after I'd a sufficient amount of reverence had gone by and a number of drafts. I just thought, the hell with this. I have to make this my own and put her out of my mind and um, put all the restrictions out of my head and thought, okay, what's what's the most compelling story I can tell? And she gave me, obviously, so many things to... To, to draw to, from. To draw but, from. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've... I've she, she's been very, very generous. It's hard to be generous with your material, but I think she appreciates how much I've brought to her characters. And, you know, I say to her, you're the birth mother, I'm the stepmother. When they're at my house, they do what I, I love say. I that. So they're, they're really different characters. Once they stepped out of the pages of the book, they, they do what I tell them to do. Right, right. <laughs> so. Now, on that note, because I have to say, like, what, and I tell so many writers to watch your pilot as a training ground for how to write a strong pilot and and my reasoning for this is because I loved not only do I love the case and the fact that it's so personal and and is has your uh, silence of the lambs type of feel and helps us know her character so much from the very very beginning to the narcissistic mother to the relationship that she has with Mora to to the animals, the arc with the animals and, and Friday the dog and then the tortoise at the end. I mean, those touches just made it stand out so much. Like how how in writing these characters, how much who do you connect with the most? Like who do you see the most of yourself? I think I'm a little bit of everybody. Yeah. Except for maybe Corsac. Right. <laughs> Frost. Right. right. Um, no, I think I'm a little bit of both uh, Mora and and uh, and Jane. I think that I have that infuriating need to pass on the last thing I read in Harper's Magazine. Hey, did you know that 92% of I drive my family <laughs> bananas? Um, I love medical information. I loved covering medical um, 
stories and topics. But I also, uh, I really strongly identify with Jane and with that little bit of that bull in a china shop, um, that tomboy energy, that that power and that, uh, you know, that that, um, th- that that energy that she has. And um, I, I like writing every one of these characters. Once, as I said, once I took them off the pages of the books, Frost, for example, was a married white guy. Corsac did not work in that precinct, and there was no animal connection. You, I brought those things in in order to give these characters more breadth and depth and also to, you know, to, let's face it, amuse myself because right. I have to live with these people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm lucky enough to, to get to live with these people, but I had to make them my own. Uh, and so you can't help but bring bits and pieces of who you are and your own past and your background and your own backstory. That that gets infused into the characters without even without really meaning to do it or attempting to do it. and I, I think that goes to say, though, if you are in touch enough with self to understand the importance of doing that as a writer because that's where your voice comes from. And I think for some people, escaping to another reality is an easier place to be than to really be in touch with what really has gone on in your life that would resonate into your characters. So I give you kudos for, because as I say, I mean, for me, when I saw the pilot, knowing you um, and knowing your voice and loving your voice, I, it like the pilot for me was a direct reflection of you the person and you the writer, even though it was adapted from a book series. So I loved I loved that, and I thought you did a beautiful job with that. Um, now, how does the writing the writer's room work on Rizzoli and Isles? How do you guys break story? Um, how many writers are on staff? Well, when you went through my long list of credits, you mentioned all the shows I've been on that have been canceled. Right. You, you forgot one, my very first TNT breaking news. Right. First show I was ever on. Right. So I've been I've I've been under the tutelage of a number of different showrunners who do things and everybody does it a little bit differently. It's kinda of like a chef. I like the writer's room. I find that collective brain power to be very helpful, particularly in the early stages when you're breaking a story. And it it's just why do it by yourself if you can do it in a room with people and get it done, you know, 10 times as fast, sometimes even faster than that. Um, so generally, we, we had a very small writing staff. There were only four of us, but we only we only did 10 episodes. Um, I wrote four of the 10, yeah. and then I had three other writers to do the other six. Um, but anyway, we were a small, very compatible little group, and we spent generally mornings uh, from about 10 to 1 in the room. Um, and then we'd come back after lunch and spend another couple of hours until everybody was a little bit fried, and then we'd do something, something else, go off and write, or um, you know, watch dailies, or or something like that. But I I think chunks of time when you are putting together episodes um, is incredibly helpful. And um, I prefer to do it in a smaller group. When I have more writers, we may break off into into two groups. Mm-hmm. And little little by little, you come to know what your strengths are and what the strengths of the other people in the room are. And, um, and you want to just tap into what everybody does best. And my feeling is it's sort of like with my family. I, I won't let my daughters badmouth each other. <laughs> oh, she's gone. I'm going to say something mean. Um, I, f- I feel the same way about a, the writer's room. That it's, it's kind of a sacred place. And, uh, and I want to be able to share things about my life. And I don't really want to. It's just sort of a necessary part of being there. Thank you for listening. You can hear this interview in its entirety along with dozens more on the StoryWise podcast. Just go to iTunes or GenCasantiConsultancy.com.